Hey everybody and welcome to Brewing TV. I'm your host Michael Dawson. And I'm your other host Jake Keeler. Today we take a look at the brewery that introduced the two of us to craft beer. And while there, we'll meet the keynote speaker from this year's National Home Brewers Conference. But first... A lot of people have asked us, how did that open fermented Hefeweizen from episode 4 turn out? Today, we're going to give you a little analytical tasting on camera. We're holding here Bleicherweizen 3.0, the topless version. To, to rewind, for people that aren't familiar with episode 4, now this was an open fermentation done at home, right here in this setting in Dawson's basement. Uh, a lot of people commented on, you know, oh man, it's just freaking me out, how can you not put saran wrap over that? I mean, some kind of protective barrier. And as far as I know, from what I saw and from, from what I know about this beer, it was, it was completely open. It was during the primary fermentation. Totally uncovered for 72 hours. I uh, came down in the middle of the night after pitching the yeast on the first day and I almost put a lid on it and I thought I need to be scientifically, I need to have scientific integrity. <laughs> I need to be scientifically integritous. <laughs> and just left it totally uncovered. Right. Uh, it's pretty dark, but, you know, a partial boil extract version uh, with a little Munich malt. It's uh, to be expected. The uh, flavor, I find, after brewing this recipe with minor tweaks for about three years, it's, uh, it's kind of a fruit bomb. You think that's fair to say? Yeah, the first thing I noticed after you poured it out was the, the overwhelming fruitiness of, of, the, of the aroma, the, the esters definitely come through much stronger than I would normally expect from a jefe. Mm -hmm. Lots of plum, apple, banana, but not mm -hmm. too much banana. Not too much banana. Actually, I expected, to, I expected to smell more banana, and I don't know if it was because I expected it to be overwhelming, because it was an open fermentation, and typically that's what you hear about those beers, is that they've got a very strong mm -hmm. banana aroma to them. It wasn't really there, and now only upon sort of like having a couple sips and really thinking about it do I recognize that it is there in more pronounced amounts. Really strong cloves is another thing I yeah, found. absolutely. Really, uh, snappy cloves, but not overpowering. There's a little sourness, a little tartness in the flavor, but it finishes soft, so it's not a vinegarized acetobacter infection or anything like mm -hmm. that. The beer is about like it should be for mm -hmm. uh, a wheat beer, just very much wheat beery. I propose a scientific experiment. Viewers, you can help us. Let's do a side-by-side, -side, closed, and open fermentation of the same recipe. Yeah. I suggest the Northern Brewer Potter's Beer Kit. It's a One of my favorites. Trappist-style single. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good, good beer. Yeah, the recipe was developed by Stan Hieronymus, who wrote Brew Like a Monk, mm -hmm. and Kristen England, who's the BJCP Continuing Education Director. Two dudes who know what they're talking about. Right. Uses the Y yeast 3787 Trappist Ale yeast, which is like the 3068. It's a top cropper, so you, it's used by some monasteries in open fermentations. I propose that whoever wants to brew a batch of that beer, split it in half, do one half closed, one half open, We'll brew a batch, split it, and send us your notes. Right. Taste them side by side. Send us some notes by the end of July and then sometime in August. We'll do an on-air tasting like this and we'll read some of your comments. Sounds great, man. I would look forward to that. Cheers. All for brew. Brew for all. Psst. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. I want some bratwurst. So with all these multiple vessels, you can just kind of nest brews together. So the maximum output of this brew house, if we get eight brews in a 24-hour cycle, that's probably about the best it could do. Wow. Every home brewer has a brewing hero they look up to. Jake and I actually have many, and this week we were able to meet one of them. You know, and now, you know, recently it's starting to slow up a little bit, but the past few years there's been uh, an obsession with hops. I hadn't noticed, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Mark Stutrud is the man behind Summit Brewing Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
The company crafts award-winning beers including its Extra Pale Ale and Great Northern Porter. Founded in 1984, the first batches of beer were brewed at Summit's original facility, a small engine shop turned brewery. So we started out draft beer only the first year, bottled beer the beginning of our second year in business. Summit now operates out of a much larger brewery. Brewing TV had a chance to see the entire facility, enjoy a few beers and talk with Mark about the birth of both Summit Brewing and the craft beer movement. As you can imagine, the American beer landscape of the early 80s left plenty to be desired. You would walk into a restaurant or a tavern and if they had eight beers on draft, six of them were light beers maybe an imported one, but if it was imported, it might be bass. It yeah. also takes the, the labor equation out of it because you can't be running up and down four floors, yeah. opening and closing yeah. valves when you have to. We, well, we got reactions from everybody. I'll put it that way. Okay. <laughs> when I say it was mixed, um, it was either overwhelmingly positive or overwhelmingly disgusted. Um, uh, people were uh, not so much offended uh, with the flavor profile and the uh, degree of hoppiness, uh, but they were probably shocked, taken aback. Um, there were a lot of people that really hadn't experienced, uh, you know, more flavorful beers. You know, being, being an intense or an extreme beer uh, back then in 86, uh, wasn't even a part of the terminology. We were actually uh, deviant. And um, there was a local food writer, for example. Uh, she used to write for the Pioneer Press. And we were called that little esoteric brewery in St. Paul. And this was a food writer. And another little deal that we do that's a little bit different is we do what's called malt conditioning. It's like in between dry milling and wet milling. It had to do with the personalities of the individuals. Um, certainly there's a direct connection to home brewing. I mean, Ken Grossman talks about his, you know, background in home brewing, and I was a home brewer. And usually when I would uh, brew at home, it was barley wines or imperial stouts or something that uh, was not as available uh, or readily available in the area. Something esoteric. Yeah, I, yeah, there you have it. There's, there's the origin right there, I guess. All of the large FEs are fermentation vessels. Uh, each large one will hold two brews. So it's about 300 barrels. Summit's grown from producing 1,500 barrels of beer in 1987 to 88,000 barrels last year. Over the course of 20 years, beer trends have come and gone, and tastes have changed. At one time, Summit's beer was described as esoteric and deviant. Now Mark hears that they're too traditional. You know, I mean, I have to be real careful. Uh, like when I get these emails or when somebody says, ah, Summit, you know, they're a bunch of uh, old traditional fogies. I gotta make sure I don't take that personally. And, and actually be pretty thankful that people are actually more engaged when it comes to yeah. talking about beer. When you get in that ignited mode of where you really want to argue about what's right and what isn't, first of all, you got to figure out whether or not you're arguing about a brand or a style. And if you're arguing about a brand, well, then you got to change the question or the setting and then somehow skew the conversation to where you start talking about styles. And then once you get to styles, you can break it down pretty easily uh -huh. because our IPA certainly is not a highly hopped West Coast IPA. It's very English in its origin. We use uh, East Kent Goldings, and East Kent Goldings are an earthy hop. They've got that earthy characteristic about them. They're not floral and herbal. They're not slapped the side of your face with citrus. It's totally soft. Here you've got a beer drinker that really doesn't quite understand style, unless they're a home brewer, unless they've really researched it and delved into it. I think home brewing is basically a pursuit of discovery. It's, um, you know, and, and being actively involved in the process. Mark has seen all sides of that process. 
Homebrewer Mark Stuttrud attended one of the first National Homebrewers Conferences, Boulder, Colorado, 1983. Fast forward to 2010, Brewmaster Mark Stuttrud delivers this year's keynote address. To be perfectly honest, I don't really know exactly what I'm going to say yet, but I've had a lot of different notions of how I might approach it. I guess my only responsibility is to uh, burn up about 40 minutes and keep people entertained. The fact that from uh, 1983, when there are just a few hundred people there, to where you know up to 2,000 people show up to these conferences, it speaks volume about the importance of beer in our society. And then the fact that um, somebody would devote a lot of their free time brewing beer as opposed to fishing or cutting grass at the cabin or going up north. Mark has witnessed the transformation of our beer culture as a home brewer and a pro brewer. He's been a deviant and a traditionalist. Through three decades of change, some things remain constant. I, I, I think the passion has probably been a continuum underneath because that really shakes out. I mean, every once in a while you'll hear, talk, hear people talk about small breweries and getting into the industry. Uh -huh. And if you sit down with somebody, they'll say, well, there are two kinds of people who start breweries. The ones that are in love of money and the ones that are in love of beer. And so the ones that really are passionate about beer, uh, that, that's been really the backbone and been uh, the soul, so to speak, of this, this whole movement. I also think the uh, social aspects um, of beer drinking it continues to be a constant, even though the styles are different. Mm -hmm. You can sit down with damn near anybody and have a beer with them, no matter what the style is, and, and have a better conversation than you would otherwise. That's a universal, too. I think so. I have to agree with Mark 100% that beer, to me, is one of the best social mediators. I know that after I've had a couple, I can actually have a conversation with you. You're still not tolerable, so I need more to drink. Good point. Summit was the beer that got me started on good beer. Yeah, me too. The first beer I ever had was a pig's eye. And it's amazing that I ever returned to beer after that. <laughs> the second beer I had was a Summit, and it was like the heavens opened up and light shone down. It was revelatory. I told Mark this, too. When I studied abroad uh, in college, I was in North Ireland, and I had friends from the UK and Germany, and they would give me all kinds of grief about American beer, but I was able to say, because of Summit and places like it, we have good beer, you just don't know about it. Now, the rest of the world is chasing U.S. beer. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they just won a uh, gold medal at the World, Bur uh, world Beer Cup for their uh, extra pale ale. Another gold medal. Yeah, yeah, it's a testament to that. And it's nice to see, after all these years, that something from our backyard, essentially in St. Paul here, has gained worldwide recognition and is respected as a brewery. When I was in college, I lived right here in St. Clair Avenue, and we used to go up and down to the bars, and Summit was always on tap. And so, you know, it became the local beer. It was the beer that everybody drank. And I didn't know how good it was, actually, until I started drinking more craft beer and comparing it and, and seeing what we had. And, and I think to any community, whether you're living in a small town or a big city, I think it's important to recognize the fact that when you have a good brewery in town, you should really you know, support that brewery because it is a rare thing. It's not, and not every place in America, not every place in the world for sure, has that sort of dynamic going on. Hey man, we could sit here and drink Happy Bites and unwrap all day, but um, we gotta get ready. Yeah, you're right. Five days from now, we've got the National Home Brewers Conference. We got a party Wednesday night with the Brewing Network and Northern Brewer. We've got our hospitality suite booth that we've got a man. We gotta run around, do a million interviews. Mark's keynote address is on Friday. So if you're going to be there, please come by, say hi, check out our video guy, Chip. And if you're not fortunate enough to make it to the conference this year, we're going to be dropping a very special episode that Friday the 18th that we hope you enjoy. Very special. Very special. All for brew. Brew for all. 
Did you understand that? No. <laughs> I couldn't get a question out of that. Uh, I know. <laughs> All right. <laughs>